Thanks, Tim. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us. This is another in a series of uh, MTA reports on the MTA's response to COVID-19. And with that, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Sarah Feinberg, Acting President of New York City Transit. Thanks, Pat. Thanks for joining us today. I want to provide, uh, share an update on the homeless uh, crisis, and then we'll take any questions you have as well. We're pleased that the city has finally agreed to dedicate resources to address this issue. It is making a world of difference already for our customers and our employees, and many of whom have felt fear and anxiety over the past few weeks. So I want to thank them for stepping up. I want to be clear. The status quo has been completely unacceptable to us. And it's my job to ensure that everyone who rides our system feels safe when they're riding with us, feels secure, and that our workforce feels safe and secure. Safety and security is an integral part of our mission. So here are a few updates on progress we've made over the last 48 hours. The city deployed approximately 40 NYPD officers to World Trade Center Station on Monday evening. They were joined by 10 social service providers and six MTA police officers. Working together, the team removed more than 100 riders who were remaining on the trains at the end of the line. And most importantly, those individuals were connected with the health care options and social services that they need and deserve. During this time, access to the station was restricted for a short period of time while we cleaned all of the train cars, the platforms, and the station. Again, that was Monday night. Last night, I went up to 96th Street Station on the Q Line with my colleague Pat Warren. There we had about 20 New York City police officers and seven MTA PD officers and 10 social service workers. Again, same process, train comes into the station, uh, individuals who are on the train leave the train, cleaners enter the train, clean the train, and uh, those who need social services and other services are offered them. Again, access was restricted during this time and social services were provided. I spoke with several New Yorkers last night about their plight. I know others did as well. This has been a heartbreaking experience for all of us. This is not something new that we've been working on. Uh, this has been something we've been working on at least under my tenure for many months and something that the MTA has been working on for many years. Individuals sleeping and living on trains is unacceptable for a lot of reasons, but foremost it's unacceptable because people deserve better lives than that. And I'm grateful and pleased that the city has stepped up and agreed that this is their responsibility to address this crisis and to provide services to these individuals. It is completely unacceptable to live in a city where an entire population of people have been left to fend for themselves when they need mental health care and they need housing services. I want to make clear the nature of the program that we've been working on to date. Again, as I mentioned, this is a end of line homeless outreach pro program that the MTA has been working on, I believe since July. My notes say August, but I believe since July, in which we go into end of line stations with MTA police officers and with outreach workers, and we offer social services and anything we can to those who remain on the train. Um, sometimes we're taken up on it and sometimes we aren't. This has been a nightly effort on our part, sometimes at four stations, sometimes at eight, sometimes at more. Every single night we are out there. In the last few days, we've been joined by NYPD, which again has been extremely useful to have more people on the field and more um, hands on deck to address it. But on Monday, they were in one station. Last night, I'm told, they were certainly in the station I was in, I'm told they were in 10 stations last night. What we need is for them to be in all of our stations. We need them to be in all 41 end of line stations, which is where we have the biggest issues. I've asked the mayor to do this. We're awaiting word, but that is the most critical thing that we could use at this moment. And we need them to commit to doing this long term. We are in a particularly problematic moment because we are in this health crisis. And so this is, um, a focus particularly for our essential workers, for those who are using our system, and I think it's raised the level of anxiety related to this, but this is something that we were seeing long before the pandemic, and it's something that we will see beyond this wave and into the second wave and subsequent waves, 
and into the future. And so this needs to be a long-term commitment, not just something that gets us through the most recent cold spell or until the weather breaks or until we can get through this hump. In the context of this crisis, we've also made the following changes to strengthen our code of conduct. No person, the, the changes are as follows. One, no person is permitted to remain in a station for more than an hour. Two, during a public health emergency declared by the governor, no person can remain on a train or on the platform after an announcement that the train is being taken out of service. Number three, wheeled carts greater than 30 inches in length or width, including shopping and grocery carts, are banned from our system. I'm sure there'll be questions, we're happy to take them. But in closing, the bottom line is the city needs to do better. The residents of this city deserve better and the city needs to do better. We cannot leave the most vulnerable to suffer quietly in a tunnel or a train. And our workforce, the men and women who work at New York City Transit, who show up every single day to move essential workers, to operate buses, to operate trains, to clean stations, to clean train cars, should not be left to clean up the mess that the city refuses to contend with. Our customers should not have to board a car that's been used as a shelter. Our essential workers on the front lines of this pandemic should not have their commutes adding to the stress adding to their stress during this time. Thank you, and we'll take your questions. Opening the question this afternoon will be David Myers, a Meyer of the New York Post. David. Thanks, Tim. Um, I guess this question uh, for Sarah, um, a multi-part question. Um, uh, just in response to what, you, to what you just told us, what, what has the city's response been to the request that NYPD be at all terminals? Uh, why terminals in particular? Won't people just uh, move to the next station over or to elsewhere in the system? Um, and then how is, you mentioned that the stations were temporarily, temporarily closed for these um, efforts. How is that different from what the mayor requested yesterday, which is that the stations be closed for four hours? Okay, so for, so let me take the first part first, which is why, which I think is why terminals. Um, so this is where we have um, noticed our problem most significantly. So since the beginning of working on this effort, the issue seems to uh, land squarely in the end of line terminals, uh, not just because that is where the individuals who we're trying to assist are, um, but because that's also the best place for us to reach them. So we could just as easily, for example, likely reach whatever, 95% or 99% of those same people, the station before the end of line terminal, but the train is only gonna stay in that station for 20 seconds, 30 seconds, one minute, whatever, before it moves on to the end of line terminal or to the end of line station. At the end of line station, the train is taken out of service for cleaning. And so that is where the train is going to stay for anywhere from, depending on the time of day, you know, six minutes, eight minutes, 10 minutes, and overnight, 24 minutes, maybe 32 minutes for quite some time. So that is, that is an opportune moment for us to both offer people services, help people off the train, and then clean the train. Um, so that's, that's why end of line terminals, that's really the only, the only sort of beauty to it. Um, I think your next question was, did we close stations overnight? So I used the word restricted access for a reason. Some of this is semantics, and frankly, I think part of the confusion and the issue between uh, us and the mayor's office has been a bit of talking past each other. The mayor keeps talking about closing stations between the hours of 12 and 5. We are open to anything that resolves this issue. We have gone, we have done a restricted access approach where we inform people that we are taking the train out of service, we're cleaning the train, we're cleaning the platform, we're offering services to people. It's not a great moment for people to be hanging out on the platform, not that they were anyway. It's not a great moment for people to be, you know, waiting and observing and, and, um, and deciding to spend 30 minutes on the platform before the next train leaves. But we have not been stopping people from entering the station. If you're an essential worker and you're trying to go to the go to your grocery store job or your hospital job or your pharmacy job, we have not been stopping those folks. The NYPD has said that they have closed some stations overnight in order to go through this process. I think we're talking past each other. Frankly, the commissioner and I have been trading um, texts and voicemails today, and so we haven't connected yet. I actually think that what they're doing is, is restricting access to the station. They're just using the word closure. Um, it would be good to land somewhere on this because the the um, the honest truth right now is that uh, there is not enough traffic 
between the hours of 12 and 5 of essential workers that we should be closing stations down so that those people are unable to go to work. That said, if we get to a point where that's the only answer and that's the only way that we can address this, we're certainly open to it. But for now, I think we're talking past each other. Does that answer uh, your question, David? Uh, he is cut off. He gave me a thumbs up. All right, we'll, we'll take that. Uh, we're moving right on to Dan Rivoli of New York One. Dan. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I'm reading a, a text alert that went to transit workers about this, which is called the NYPD Homeless Removal Program. And this goes to the issue of restricted access or closing the station. It says, uh, list terminals, 179th Street, Flatbush, Woodlawn, and Pelham, NYPD removing homeless from trains. Customers cannot enter train at the terminal. Shuttle buses notified for to take people from terminals to the first station over. Um, how, what is the protocol for this? How does that get decided of when, uh, you know, access is restricted or, or commuters can't get to the last stop? They have to get to the one right before and then take the bus. So that's exactly my point. At the station that I was at last night, that did not happen. Um, and so, and I don't think that's, I don't, I don't think that's necessary. It wasn't necessary last night, and I'm not sure that it's necessary generally. Um, I've asked for numbers on how many passengers were potentially diverted who were stopped from entering um, stations at the, the specific stations that you talked about, and I have not gotten that data yet. Um, you know, the pol I, my understanding is the police did not specifically call for shuttle buses, but because transit is very effective at doing their job, as soon as the RCC got word that a station could potentially be closed, all of our processes start up, and so we started organizing shuttle buses in the middle of the night. Look, I'll be honest, in my conversation with the mayor the other day, we had a clear conversation in which he said if we could get to a point where we are closing stations, he would handle organizing and paying for all shuttle buses. That's clearly not what happened last night. And so, again, we're in early days on this. I don't want to, um, to brush past the fact that I am thrilled that they are finally at the table and assisting us. I could not be happier that they are finally in stations and helping us with this problem. And so if it takes us a day or two to uh, reach a landing place on whether we call it restricted access or closures and who runs the shuttle buses, then we'll live with it. But, um, but to your point, Dan, uh, it was not coordinated uh, on the front end because as far as we knew, stations were not going to be closed. Next up is Dana Rubenstein of Politico. Dana. Hi. I'm, I'm just curious about one thing you said. You mentioned that you thought that this should be an ongoing uh, expense for the city and the NYPD. Why then, how does that make sense given that the MTA is expanding its police force by 60%? Well, so first, our, the MTA police force does more than just run a homeless outreach program. program. So, so let me start um, at the beginning of your question. Safety and security is going to be our top priority now, and it's going to be our top priority in the future. Part of that is about our homeless outreach program, and part of that is everything else that MTA police do. Um, and so the reason I said that this needs to be an ongoing commitment from the city is because this is not... The, the crisis with the homeless population is not a crisis that's going to end tomorrow or when this pandemic ends or when we sort of get past the first wave. This is an ongoing issue and it's the city's responsibility. Now, we're never going to just take all of our uh, folks off the table and say, this is all on the city and if the city doesn't do anything, I guess our system just isn't gonna be safe and secure because that's not responsible and we're never gonna do that. But it's absolutely clear to me that this is, should be an ongoing responsibility of the city. And the next question is from Paul Berger of the Wall Street Journal. Paul. The subway car cleaning. I see that the governor said that he wanted them uh, cleaned every every day, so that in the morning commuters can be sure they're going to be clean. So, what's the MTA going to be doing differently going forward? And also, how are you going to staff it, and how much is it going to cost? So you broke up a little bit at the beginning, but I think I got the gist. Um, so the governor has asked for a plan from us for how we will go about disinfecting and cleaning. 
uh, cars uh, and buses and stations every 24 hours. We're working on that plan and we'll present it to him tomorrow uh, as he's requested. Um, we have not worked out details related to it yet, but look, I think he's exactly right that the public expects and is right to expect that we are doing everything we possibly can to keep them safe and secure at this moment in time and then as the city starts to open up and reopen as the economy starts to reopen that we're doing everything we can to make sure that our cars are clean and disinfected and sanitary and and that we are um, addressing it you know as frequently as we possibly can and i think you asked how many people how many workers it will require and that's to be tbd and cost, do you have any estimate? Same. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, next question is from Alfonso Castillo of Newsday. Alfonso? Hi, everybody. Um, as usual, I am concerned primarily with uh, the Long Railroad and uh, the commuter railroad, so maybe this question better posed uh, for Pat. Th this plan that you're working on that you plan to present to uh, the governor will it include any changes to the uh, the cleaning disinfecting protocols at your commuter railroads, or will it be um, exclusively for the subways? And I have a follow-up question after you answer that. Yeah, Alfonso, we will uh, we are looking at uh, what Metro North and Long Island Railroad need in terms of uh, the cleaning issue, uh, and we'll be reporting any changes going forward. The focus this morning, which is uh, this afternoon rather. Uh, which is why uh, Sarah's at the podium is on New York City Transit. Okay, and, and then a, a quick follow-up. Um, uh, uh, understanding that, that this issue with uh, homelessness would not be uh, an issue on the commuter railroads, but uh, before the, the whole pandemic, there were certainly a lot of concerns about homelessness at uh, LIR station waiting rooms, that kind of thing. I can imagine with a lot fewer riders, that could be uh, more of a problem these days. Have there been any increased reports of, of loitering in railroad station, waiting rooms, that kind of thing? Uh, I, I can't say that any of that hasn't happened on the Long Island Railroad or Metro North, but I can tell you that the uh, customer complaints and the concerns uh, from uh, an MTA uh, point of view have been centered on New York City Transit subways, uh, in, in particular filling in, at, at the railroad and Kathy Rinaldi at Metro North have, have been focused on these quality of life issues both before and during the pandemic. And we move on to Michelle Kasky of Bloomberg. Michelle, you're up. Hi, thank you. My question, as usual, is more finance related, so and it's off topic. So I don't know if you want to um, uh, push me towards, uh, you know, after uh, we've gotten no, through go all for those it. questions. Okay. On, Michelle, you're, right. you're Bloomberg. We okay. are not surprised okay. by this. Go ahead. All right. So um, uh, I have two questions. First of all. Um, to, for Bob Ferran or, or, or Pat, uh, do you anticipate, is this MTA anticipate utilizing the Federal Reserve's first ever program to lend to states and, and cities? Uh, and actually, is the MTA able to, to access that program? And then the other question I had was, uh, are you still aiming to uh, sell your bonds on May 4th? Uh, Bob? Sure. Uh, right now, we cannot uh, go to the program, that's the Municipal Liquidity Facility, directly. We're having discussions with the members of the Reserve, but we can't go directly. But we could go indirectly through either the state or the city or some other eligible borrower. Uh, they would then borrow, turn around, loan the money back to us, and then we could take advantage of the facility that way. Um, with regard to the market, we are planning on being in the market next week. I think it was last week we said we could come as early as this week, uh, but then the state came out with its new disclosure, as you know, talking about a reduction in aid to localities. We wanted to make sure that we got that disclosure into our annual disclosure document, which is being filed right now, as well as supplementing the uh, preliminary official statement, which we had sent out last week. Um, we plan on having an investor call a taped on Friday morning, we wanted to have this new disclosure already out in the public before we had that uh, taped investor call. And then it'll be available electronically for investors later Friday all during the weekend. So that's our schedule. What are you hearing from the state and city in regard to using that, that new federal program? I mean, do you think that's going to be 
something that the MTA will do, go through the state or the city to access that first ever program? We're having discussions right now with the state. Thank you. Next question is Terrence Smith of ABC News. Terrence, go ahead. Hi there. Yes, Terrence Smith from ABC News here. I was curious to see as you're continuing to work on developing plans for staffing to sanitize stations, I wanted to know what steps are you further ensuring to protect workers? And personally, have you reached out to any of the workers' families that have lost members to this pandemic? Yeah, so on the on the sanitizing uh, and the, the cleaning, so, but I'll, I'll take it more broadly than that. So first of all, as we are contemplating um, stepping up our cleaning and disinfecting efforts, safety of our workforce will continue to be front of mind. So beyond that, that's something that we're always prioritizing. So um, we can get you the latest numbers in terms of distribution of gloves and masks and PPE, um, because frankly, I don't remember, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but we're well into millions on gloves. We're past a million on masks, and there's, there's lots we can share with you on that. Um, but we are, and we've also taken a bunch of additional steps, making sure that our workforce is, you know, able to social distance wherever they can, trying to uh, make sure that we are, um, you know, pulling folks who aren't working out of places where they would be interacting with others so that there's not, you know, an inability to social distance, making sure that people are home uh, or at least off of work when we know that they're not needed so that we're resting up folks um, for later. So we're taking a whole bunch of of um, steps to make sure that we're keeping the workforce safe and we can we can get you specific numbers in terms of the families of those who have passed yes i mean so um, we try to reach out to every single family and we do reach out to every single family um, you know the circumstances vary um, there are uh, this is not always a moment when people necessarily want to talk which i think is totally understandable so um, we leave a lot of messages and then um, have conversations later. But myself and um, uh, Sally Labrera and a couple other folks on our team uh, make sure that we certainly that we connect with every family. And I try to make sure that I talk to um, multiple people in each family. It takes, you know, it takes a while to connect with folks, but we get there. And the next question is from Steve Nesson of WNYC. Steve. Uh, hi there. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you said the governor was right that the subways need to be cleaner. He called them disgusting this week. So are you agreeing with him? And are you also saying that the cleaning every 72 hours wasn't really getting them clean enough? And what exactly is the problem with the cleaning that's been going on? And I have a homeless question as well after that, if you don't mind. Sure. Well, there's a couple different issues here. So first, there's cleaning and there's disinfecting, which you would think that there is not a difference between, but in fact, there is. So, so disinfecting, we were do, we've been doing every every 72 hours, which is literally a deep clean. So it is, you know, a bleach product or the or the other disinfectants that we know kill um, kill as much, as much as we can possibly kill, and it's a top to bottom clean of every single car. Um, as you can imagine, that is time consuming, and so that's disinfecting. On the cleaning side, is you know sweeping out the cars and cleaning up spills and leftover trash and food and honestly um, for those of you I'm sure many of you have seen it all of the other things that happen in our cars which are completely unacceptable and example number one of why we need more help dealing with some of the issues that we're currently dealing with so um, to look I like I said, I agree with the governor. We need to be doing more. If I had, you know, an unlimited workforce and unlimited resources, I think we would all agree that we would be we would be cleaning and disinfecting cars every couple of hours. Um, but you know, we are such a large city, such a large fleet, such a large system that um, exercises like that are um, difficult, if not impossible. But I think he's exactly right to be pushing us to to do more and to uh, make more progress. Uh, and as far as the homeless issue, as we all know, it's not new. You called it a crisis, but it's been ongoing for a while. Is there any evidence that there are more homeless people now than before the pandemic? And why haven't you asked the governor for help before this if the city wasn't forthcoming? Well, I mean, I'm not sure that a crisis means that it necessarily has to be um, short-lived or temporary. I mean, I'd call 
climate change a crisis too, and that doesn't seem to be short lived. So I guess I, I guess I argue your semantics on that point. Um, this has been certainly going on for a long time, and I'm not sure that we have the tools or the expertise to end it anytime soon. But we're going to keep doing whatever we can to address it. Um, I think the sec what was the second part of your question? Sec the se second part of your third question. Hello. Oh, uh, just uh, why not ask the governor for help earlier since the city has been, you know, not providing the resources that you've needed for months and months now. Why not go to the governor earlier? Well, I have frequent conversations with the governor about what we need, and I feel like my um, requests have always been answered. Um, and so one of the things that I said that we needed some time ago before I, uh, before I stepped into this role was additional police. Um, and, and that's how we ended up in a place where we're um, hiring additional police now. So I feel like I've called on the governor many times for help and gotten good answers in return. On to Jose Martinez of the city. Jose. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, a couple of weeks back, I asked Pat about increased cleaning costs uh, that are going to accompany uh, station cleaning and rolling stock cleaning after this pandemic. Given the commitment that has now been made to the governor, uh, has there been anything yet in terms of how much more money is going to be needed uh, for this extended and extra cleaning effort? So, uh, Sarah, let me let me take with that one. Uh, Jose, we're not in a position to uh, cite a specific number. Certainly, it is going to cost significantly more than we budgeted for rolling stock and bus and station cleaning at the end of the year. Uh, and as we update the financial plan, we'll be reporting on that. Thank you. All, all I was going to say was I just I don't view this as a commitment to the governor. It certainly is a commitment to the governor that will get him a plan. But I view it as a commitment to our ridership that we're going to do everything we can to um, keep the system as safe as we possibly can. And joining us next is Clayton Gusa from the Daily News. Clayton. Hey, can you hear me? We hear you. Okay. Um, I, have, I have two small parts to this question. Um, first. Do you guys have an update on um, the number of MTA employees who have passed away from COVID so far? And also, do you have any comment? Um, uh, uh, train crew member Benjamin Schaefer has reportedly passed away from the disease. He um, has a you know pretty long record of with including some heroic acts at the agency. So can you give me an updated number? And do you have anything to say um, about Mr. Schaefer's passing? Uh, Clayton, the number of uh, uh, MTA colleagues who have succumbed to the virus at this point is 96 uh, uh, who have uh, passed away. Uh, and uh, we mourn and grieve uh, the passing of every uh, one of those with uh, uh, family and friends. And, and just one more. The, the year press shop last week shared an analysis um, that showed the, uh, that argued the MTA death rate um, from COVID was lower than that of the citywide death rate, but didn't adjust for uh, factors like age and pre-existing conditions. Is it is it the MTA's opinion that that this that these this number of deaths was inevitable? That you guys are actually have a relatively low death rate? Well, look, I, I think it is too early, as the governor has noted. We're uh, in the middle of this pandemic and this. Uh, uh, disaster. Uh, I'll note the article in the New York Times today that suggested the number of cities around the nation that the uh, COVID-19 uh, fatality rate may be uh, understated. I, I, I think that doing that type of epidemiological uh, analysis will require uh, experts uh, and is uh, probably better done uh, when the pandemic has subsided rather than uh, during it because the numbers uh, and the perspectives are un will undoubtedly change. Next question is from Dave Colon, Streets Blog. Dave, you're up. Hey, Pat, hey, everyone. Uh, this might be a better question for Bob. It might be one uh, that you can also speak to. I might have a follow-up after that. Uh, there's word out of Albany that when the mid-year budget adjustments come in uh, sometime in May, that there's going to be money taken out of uh, MTA dedicated taxes, uh, you know, things uh, coming out of the Metropolitan Mass Transportation Operating Assistance. Uh, and so I'm just curious, is that 
acceptable uh, to the MTA? Should something like that happen? And does that hurt the case for a federal bailout uh, request going forward if the state is just taking money out the back end? Well, the disclosure in Albany does acknowledge the fact that they have had a significant revenue loss as a result of the COVID-19 and also the effect on the economy and the additional cost going forward. And I think the estimate is a loss of revenue about $13.3 billion. Uh, it's going to affect the, everyone across the state. Uh, the disclosure that we put forth said that aid to localities will be reduced. Uh, the revenue that we received that could be subject to that is about $3.2 billion. We received significant other dollars that would not be affected because that comes to us directly. But we'll see what has to happen. We're a member of the authority of the state and we can't say that we're separate and independent in terms of no mitigation, no impact on our finances when it is affecting every single uh, aspect of state government. Yeah, and, and David, I would add to Bob's comment the following. If anything, it affirms and validates our need for federal funding. If you look at the letter that we sent to the New York congressional delegation a, a couple of weeks ago, accompanied by the McKinsey analysis, it noted that our revenue shortfall was of two types, right? First, a significant a reduction in toll and fare revenue as a result of the precipitous decline in ridership and a precipitous decline in dedicated subsidies and taxes from, uh, that have been passed by the legislature over a period of years. So if anything, the expected reduction in state payments affirms and validates the dire need for $3.9 billion of funding from the federal government on the next round of CARES. Right, but if that money, we know there's gonna be less of the money, but if the money gets then further taken out, to go into the general fund, that's okay? No, it, 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 is not, it is not okay. Obviously, every dollar that we had budgeted, whether it was toll or fare revenue or dedicated subsidies and taxes, uh, which have both declined precipitously as a result of the pandemic, that is the basis for us making the case that we need federal funding. Um, and I just wanna ask, there is a word that the inspector general was supposed to do a report on the practices that the MTA was doing when it comes to uh, its homeless outreach efforts. So I just was wondering what the status of that was. It uh, started, I guess they got the oversight starting in October. Is that report coming out anytime soon? Uh, David, as you know, the inspector general is uh, independent uh, of the uh, MTA uh, and MTA management. That's a question that should be addressed to the inspector general. All right, we've got uh, one more question. This one's from Christina Goldbaum of the New York Times. Then Sarah Feinberg has a closing thought. So Christina first, then Sarah. Christina, you're up. Um, thanks. Uh, just on the issue of cleaning, I mean, obviously when you're dealing with limited resources, there can be a trade-off between, you know, steps to deal with overcrowding, like running more trains and cleaning and disinfecting trains more frequently. So I'm wondering, you know, as you guys are planning you know, for the state's reopening, which you're planning to prioritize more, increased service or increased cleaning? And also, when can riders expect a plan uh, from the MTA on how you expect people to maintain social distancing once they return to the system? Uh, if I understood the question, and um, I'm not sure I totally caught all of it, I think it was how are we planning on doing both cleaning and uh, increase and increasing service to ridership, increasing service, is that right? Yeah. And I just think the answer is we have to do both. Um, so we have to make sure that we're cleaning and disinfecting, uh, and we have to make sure that we are providing the service um, that's adequate for our riders. So um, I don't think we have an option there. I think we have to do both. Um, and on run-wide, riders can expect to uh, you know, see a plan for maintaining social distancing on trains as the city begins to reopen, as people return to the system. Well, we have a lot of, I mean, we are doing a, a huge amount of planning for um, what will be um, a reopening. Um, one of the key pieces of that, to your point, is social distancing. And one of the things that we are really looking for from medical experts is really solid guidance on um, 
you know, the many, the many occasions in life, not just in, in uh, the subway system, but um, elsewhere when six feet plus a mask is not possible. So we know this is something that airlines are dealing with, that transit systems in other countries are dealing with, um, that bus systems in other cities, uh, hospitals, companies, um, businesses, um, literally almost any place in the country is having to contend with this um, same challenge. And so we are very focused on getting um, really solid guidance from medical leaders who can tell us, if not six feet in a mask, then what? Um, and I think, you know, as we look at what transit systems across the world are doing, most of them are just making sure that they are incredibly vigilant about everyone wearing a mask. And um, six feet looks almost impossible to maintain in most of the transit systems that I've seen, seen photos of. And so we're still um, coming to our own conclusion, but it will be based on, uh, on science and medical uh, opinion. Yeah, Christina, I, I would echo Sarah's comments and just add the following. We, we have been following closely what transit agencies in Europe and Asia, or Asia, starting with Asia, and then Europe are doing and what our counterparts around the United States uh, are, are doing. Obviously, the pandemic started in uh, Asia and, and Europe and those parts of the world are, are coming out of it uh, be, before North America. In, in, in addition, we have been in contact with uh, public health authorities at the federal, state, and, and, and city level, and including public health and epidemiological e experts at the you know, who are uh, now out of government. Uh, and uh, we have been talking with uh, e experts on all of these uh, all of these issues. The agencies, including uh, Transit under Sarah's leadership, but also Metro North buses, Long Island Railroad, uh, and, and bridge and tunnels, are each developing. Uh, detailed uh, uh, plans, and obviously we are focused on the effect on customers and employees and assuring customers and employees that we are running safe, appropriate uh, service, and we'll be reporting on that as we go forward. And a closing thought from Sarah Feinberg. <laughs> Um, so I did a closing thought on, uh, on homelessness. So I just want to thank the city again for stepping up. Um, the um, efforts in the World Trade Center uh, station on Monday night and the efforts at 96th Street and at other stations last night and the ongoing efforts across the city that are expected tonight and throughout the week are incredibly helpful because it means that we are able to have enough people in these stations to um, really seamlessly and um, you know, I think graciously um, and respectfully offer services to those who need them. So um, I am I am really grateful for their leadership here and um, at look forward over the coming days to um, making sure that we are coordinating seamlessly and um, easily and um, but, you know, little um, wrinkles along the way about whether, um, you know, a platform is closed or a whole station is closed really pa pa pales in comparison, in my opinion, to the fact that, um, that the two entities are working together now. So I'm grateful for that. All right. Thanks, everybody, for your questions. Appreciate that uh, here at headquarters. Also, thanks to Pat and Bob remotely. And have a good afternoon.